taking their masks. <laughs> sure, I'll stand up. Uh, my name is Adam Holman. Uh, I'm an artist. I'm a Tucson native. And uh, I've been doing sculpture since 95. And I started off with steel. I love steel. I love taking something rigid and making it look fluid. And my career was basically, I started doing some local shows around here. And then I found out about bigger shows around the country. So I started traveling around like a carny, setting up my tent, <laughs> doing my shows. And I did it for about 20 years. And uh, you know, you, you figure out the better shows in the country. Uh, you know, we go up to Seattle, San Francisco, Texas is big, Colorado. Um, and uh, yeah, I go around, I do about 12 to 14 shows a year. Um, a lot of clients, uh, a lot of business. Uh, it is exhausting to do it. So it's one of those things when COVID hit, I was like, holy cow, this is, I've been on the treadmill for 20 years. And so I started taking advantage of my client list and uh, local support, and now shows are done for me. So I get to stay home with my wife and daughter and create art, and uh, I, I'm blessed to do that. And uh, so yeah, I've done over 6,000 sculptures, and I still have all my fingers, so um, we're doing good here. So thank you for showing up and uh, being a part of this discussion. Um, I don't know if you've walked around the sculpture garden. Like I said, I had not met either one of you or seen your work, so I was impressed with both of the work that you do. And the, the, actually, their pieces are right next to each other. That's something I want to talk to you about because you work very differently than each other. Tony, are you comfortable doing a little intro? Yeah, you bet. Hi, I'm uh, Tony Bonister, and I'm also a Tucson native. I grew up here. And I learned how to weld at Catalina High School in just down Dodge ways back in the 70s. And I've been welding ever since then. Since I retired from Raytheon, I was uh, allowed to use my brain in a different way. And I could, uh, instead of doing everything at 90 degree angles, I could, I could experiment a bit. So <laughs> I've been uh, dabbling in the rusty arts for quite a while. And uh, uh, for me, much of what I do is driven by the materials that I have. And as a result, I spend a lot of time looking for materials. And that uh, makes my own behind my shop. And, speak to me I try and put something together so uh, um, but yeah Tucson native and uh, and love, love October <laughs> so I'm gonna move a little closer I hope you don't mind if I'm showing you I also work in metal but the work that I do in metal is cast which means that I don't work directly in the, the metal itself I start off with clay but at least from the pieces I've seen of these two guys they work directly in metal, which is a very different kind of process. And it looks like yours is from some found objects. Yes, um, pretty much what I do is, is repurpose things that I find. And so I'm always on the lookout for interesting pieces of metal. And the piece that I have here is, um, is a, the piece I have here is um, a battleship anchor chain uh, attached to a, um, uh, a, a wrecking ball hook and the chain I found at a scrapyard in Wilcox back 30 years ago and the big hook I found at an antique fair about three years ago. So I collect things and then something sort of comes to mind and I try and put them together. But I like to be able to keep them so that you can see what they were originally. That's great, thanks. So for those of you, I, I'm assuming there's some other artists in the group here everybody works a little bit differently so it sounds like for tony that he'll see objects that just have some particular visual interest to you as exactly what they are and then turn them into something else or add them to other pieces and i'm not familiar with your work i'm sorry but i, I do know the piece you have out here it's a great piece but um, adam works a little differently this piece is i'm going to call it a triangular pyramid kind of shape so when you do those, do you start off with drawings ahead of time? Usually the drawing occurs in my head because I'm a terrible sketch artist. It almost goes against things for me to draw it out because I'm really bad at it. Uh, so I think three-dimensionally. So when I create a piece, um, it's in my mind and I just start going with the flow. Um, you know, like Tony, I use found objects too. I kind of work backwards in the sense that, okay, I'm gonna make this sculpture. And then I see, okay, as I'm making it, what might fit into it, you know, in a natural way. 
And uh, so uh, it starts starts there, and I just find the pieces that are interesting, and if they complement the piece, they go in. If not, then I fabricate something that fits a little bit better. Well, judging from the piece that you have out here, I mean, they're pretty rigid shapes that you must have decided on ahead of time. Or yeah, there's definitely, like, I get a vision, so I know what I'm getting into, and of course, when I've done it as long as we have, we kind of, you know, know what you're getting into as, as well. That piece, the contact point, um, I use the pyramid shape just because I've always been fascinated with the, the Egyptian pyramids and, and the intention behind them. And with that one, the idea was, you know, the, the pyramid starts, of course, on the earth. That's our birthing place, Mother Earth, and then it goes up to the heavens, Father, Son, the universe, whatever, but we're in the center of that. And so the idea is to be centered, heart-centered, living that way with a connection to source and Mother Earth and being in the middle of both of those. Uh, that's the, sort of the, the idea. I wish we had other microphones, but we're going to try. There's one right up there. Mm -hmm. There's one right there. Oh, great. <clears throat> so it sounds like, Adam, for you, when you start doing your piece, there, there's a real idea, a theme, or a, a message you want to convey ahead of time? No, there you are. Yeah, it starts with a, a feeling, and uh, it's got to have a feeling and, and heart behind it. Really, the intention. I want people that look at my work to feel something. But, but I mean, it seems like there's a narrative message in it that you want to convey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, always, a storytelling is very important to me. I got my degree in creative writing from the United States. So it's always an idea. So it's the story behind this case. So, how about you, Tony? Just again, the only piece of yours that I know is the one that you have out here. And to me, that looked like it was more rather than a story um, generating the idea. The objects generated the story. Well, true. And for me, that piece sort of represents the industrial life that we have in, in this world. Uh, we can build anything, we can move anything. And that piece, that, that piece uh, sort of, to me, symbolizes the fact that we can do anything. If we put our minds to it and work together, we can build anything, we can move anything. Do you have a fabricating facility in your studio? Uh, well, I do it all myself, so it's it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's sort of uh, I do what I can with the equipment I have. I'm pretty simple when it comes down to it, but uh, I, I've gotten good at it over the years. So yeah, yeah, I I don't know if most of you are aware of what an artist's studio is like, but especially for three-dimensional artists, we tend to uh, tend to collect objects and tools. And fill up spaces and hang on to things that we think are going to show up in our work years later. Um, want to tell me a little bit about your studio? Well, I, you know, I, yeah, I have a beautiful workshop. Uh, it's a proper workshop. I, we've always used our two-car garage up until recently, and um, it was uh, we never parked inside as a result. But I retired uh, about eight years ago and built a proper workshop. So I have a large space with all my tools set up and uh, everything within reach. And uh, it just makes working a whole lot easier to have everything available. And I can leave things set up and not worry about them. And so I feel very fortunate to have the space and not just to, to work inside the shop, but the space behind the shop to store all the stuff that I need to, to work on projects. Yeah. Uh, I feel for your wives or partners or family <laughs> members. Um, how do I put this? My wife is very minimal. So I've got my studio and I tend to flow out all over the place. And I'm assuming the two of you have got some kind of a similar thing. So so my, my mom uh, has this really cool property down by the U of A called Tim Town and my shop is there and we bought an old freezer building and so it's these freezer buildings that uh, used to be in the grocery stores where all the dairy and produce is it's about 500 square feet and it's insulated and nobody can hear me in there so it's really great it's like my little mad scientist uh, area we have a quick enough i do apologize for interrupting if the owner of a white vw van with the last complaints is in the room please come see me at the front desk thank you Anyhow, there's a very nice crowd here, and we've got limited time, so I think we'll open it up a little bit if anybody's got any questions. Otherwise, we'll just... I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm 
I have a question. Can yeah. you show their artwork up here? You can't. They were doing it. Yeah, but it should be on this, but I don't know. Someone has the to last have. interview I had it on the screen. I'm not sure. I wish I was prepared to tell you enough we could. Uh, maybe the easiest way to do it is, are you an artist? No, I'm not, but I would like to see their work to see what they're talking about. Well, I'm going to try something that I normally wouldn't do, because one of my things is that visual artists' best way of talking about their work is actually visually. That's why we're visual artists. And since we don't have images, but Adam did say he was a creative writer, would you mind sort of doing a little description of what the piece actually looks like? Sure, yeah. I'm a creative writer, maybe not such a creative speaker, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you'll see it out there. It's kind of an elongated pyramid. Uh, it's got some found objects mixed in with stainless steel. So, um, and I'm happy to give you a color too. You can look at the website and get a better, better sense of uh, my work down the line. And my piece is, uh, is sort of different. It's a, it's a box with a uh, hook and chain going vertically from there and um, uh, it's it's sort of just different and it's I call it two ton not because it weighs two two thousand or four thousand pounds but because if the base were solid it's a it's a box that I made if it were solid it would weigh the, the piece would weigh four thousand pounds almost exactly as it is it weighs about 300 pounds which is much easier on my back <laughs> okay, so I, I have a question for Tony. How do you get the rust look? Um, well, it's it's I, I I try and much of what I find is already rusty, which is a benefit and a drawback because to weld it you have to have uh, conductivity, so you have to clean where you're welding. Uh, the base box is what was new steel that I purchased and welded together. And then you can get solutions to facilitate the rusting process. You can kind of spray it on or, or paint it on. And that accelerates the rusting process. And then I, I have a hose behind my shop and I, I kind of hose it down. And, and uh, it, it, it takes a while to get the really nice uh, aged look. But um, the nice thing about rust in this environment is it lasts forever. And when I make something, I, I want to make it such that it's, it's maintenance free for life and guaranteed for life. And with steel, in this environment, it's kind of that way. It seems like on your rusting, everything was kind of the same color of rust. Yeah, it's, it, it's uh, which is nice. Yeah, just part of the rusting, with the, the, the solutions you can get to help uh, accelerate rusting, and then the things that I find that are already rusted from just being outside for, for decades. So have, have you ever used Corten steel? No, uh, I I have not. No, but I saw I saw that out here on a lot of labels, and I was curious about that. Uh, the reason I'm bringing it up, Corten steel is a steel that rusting is built into it, and it stabilizes itself. So there, are, you know, working with metals, most of them do. Um, deteriorate over time, I guess is the easiest way to put it. So with steel, it is the rusting, but there is a steel that self-stabilizes, which is called core tent steel. But you know, I know a little bit. So do you use muriatic acid to? Yeah, I, I buy a solution from one of my metal supply houses that uh, just, it's, and I've used vinegar and salt as well. And uh, anything to help rusting. Yeah, same thing. I, I a lot of that, you know, there's a lot of solutions you can buy to get various effects. It's a really cool thing about steel, you can finish it in, you know, countless ways. Uh, and uh, a lot of my stuff is uh, is not, that's sort of atypical of my work, but a lot of my stuff is very polished and futuristic and modern and intended for indoors. So in cases like that, I'm putting uh, clear enamels over top of the steel and, and that's how you protect it that way. The, it, the cleaning process is expensive and I often come home with just metal dust behind my ears <laughs> from all the grinding and that kind of fun, noisy work. That, that's kind of an interesting question actually and, re and really to the point of some of this because when you talk about work rusting, work ages over time. 
and depending on whether the work is outdoors or indoors. So do you take that into account when you're doing your work? I always do, yeah. I mean, there's my intention. I want this to be in a home with somebody, you know. In indoors. Indoors, or if it's outside, then it's a whole other process. So, um, yeah, it's always on my mind. Yeah, that's one of the things that painters in general don't have to consider too much, because generally paintings we know are going to be indoors. You know, there are still environmental concerns for painters. But 3D work, uh, a lot of times, is bought to place outdoors, not necessarily always. And it's open to the elements. So work that's designed to be rusting is built into it usually. So I'm assuming for your work, you know that's going to happen, and you want it. Well, oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll clear coat something after I have the finish I want, and it gives it a nice finished look. And I, 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 I do that on pieces that will be meant for inside. Uh, for pieces that are staying outside, I, I just let them rust. And uh, a lot of the pieces I make are big pieces that stay outside forever. And again, in, in this environment, uh, it'll, it'll last forever. So can I ask why you asked about rusting? Well, I actually own one of Tony's pieces. Oh. And it just all seems so uniform. My only problem, it is outside under, and it's the, the dub. <laughs> so then I just have to wash it off now and then because of the uh, dub droppings. <laughs> but uh, I, I've often wondered how, and when I was looking at the two ton out there, how you how you get the rusting, because I figured everything isn't rusted. And, and bird droppings are just a fact of life. I think it adds to the patinas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think for any of us who work with work that's outdoors, there is a certain uh, um, amount of, I'm going to say knowledge, that the work is going to evolve. Yeah. Did everybody hear the question? No. It, the question was about Adam's work, and I guess, again, I'm not familiar, so Adam will describe it, that uh, she used the word quirky and using different objects like typewriters and things like that. So. Yeah, I do a lot of characters, so I use a lot of vintage materials, old typewriters, cameras, and I animate them. So they're, I'm taking, you know, old and blending it with the new to create a very whimsical, almost a uh, cartoon-like aspect to them. I've sold to Pixar animation several times, and my stuff seems to kind of fit into there, um, and ILM has some of my stuff. So I'm they're, they're, they're not, they're not. They're mostly just sculptural, but uh, they definitely have a sense of presence and movement and characterization, which, which I love. So that, that piece out there is certainly not representative of that work, but I'm very eclectic in my style, and uh, I appreciate uh, my mom for asking that question. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of moving on to the dynamic, the flowing mobiles, I think, Tony, you. I'm curious, having the privilege to have one of your pieces as well, thank you, about the balance. Balance your physics. Like ours is very, ours moves all kinds of directions. It's a whirly gig. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I started making whirly gigs and, and uh, pendulums and things that will move in the wind. And um, and the balancing can be a bit tricky. I mean, typically you use the pendulum process, the teeter totter, and you can get the center point. But when you want something to hang vertically, you have to have a little bit more weight at the bottom. Otherwise, you'll just sort of whatever angle and I don't think that looks right. So it, it can be a little tricky to get the right uh, uh, the right pivot point. So use a little bit of trial and error? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's you try it and the, the, the thing, I was listening to a sculpture this morning, it was a rock, rock sculpture and uh, with rock, you don't have a second chance. If, if you remove something, you want to put it back, it's too late. But with steel, you can drill a hole and if it's not quite right, you can fill it in and grind it and drill it somewhere else or bend it or... So you have a lot of flexibility with steel and so you can pick a different point and try a different balance point to see what you get that you like. Nice job. 
Yeah, that's the other thing that's different about working three-dimensionally as opposed to two-dimensionally. Three-dimensional work really needs to be viewed from all different views. So even when you have an idea in your mind, most people start off with an idea. For most of us in our world, we see the world basically two-dimensionally. And to be able to translate that into three dimensions, because you're always having to see the work and rotate the work. So both of your pieces have a lot of this sort of inviting to make your way around the work. I'm assuming that's also built into the for you. Yeah, I definitely like to have it look nice from all directions and appreciate it in that way. So I always can take that into consideration when I'm making a, a piece. It's part of the reason probably that a lot of three-dimensional work is conceived of for being outdoors because you can move around and, you know, it always makes me a little crazy when I see three-dimensional pieces in people's homes that are tucked into a corner. I almost feel like I want to see a mirror behind them or something. So do you do smaller works as well? Um, I, I, the biggest piece I have is about eight feet tall and weighs about 800 pounds. But that's not typical. I typically make smaller things that you can put on a pedestal or hang on a wall. Um, so most of my pieces are smaller, and they're a lot easier to manage, to be honest with you. Yeah, doing uh, the art shows for years, I've started off, you know, doing a lot of life-size stuff, and I have shrunk over the years just <laughs> carrying all this stuff around in your van and, and going to these different shows. It's so much easier to take the smaller stuff. And I also think when somebody purchases a piece, it's nice for them to go. Thank you. And they walk away with it. They don't have to worry about me coming to their home and installing. So well, now now I'm embarrassed because I'm sitting next to two guys who are a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, I keep making bigger things, which uh, I know enough to know that I know very little. So uh, it's <laughs> moderating. Uh, I think we only have a few more minutes. Are there any things? Sure. Tony, when you do the, the welding, like for this picture that uh, you turn, how do you, do you just hold it up there and weld it? And then so before you, before you answer, the question was, Tony's piece is, uh, it looks like a chain. It's it looks like it's just, oh. So it looks like it's suspended, but obviously in order for him to produce it, He's got to come up with some way to fight gravity, I think is the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, now I have a, a small crane inside my workshop, which makes life a whole lot easier. Uh, you can do it horizontally on a nice flat bench as well. But I, lately I've been using the crane to pull things up and hold it, and I can weld it in, in place, and it makes it a lot easier. And I've been working with chain a lot lately, and, and uh, it's sort of unique to see it going up. Um, and if you weld it, such that you can't see the well too well, then it looks it looks authentic and uh, and uh, yeah. So so I, it, the crane makes it life a lot easier. Okay, so but, you, you have a big piece in your yard of the chain going up quite high. So you did that horizontally. Well, I yeah I did on that one. I and I the the, the chain was rather unique in that I could use um, a tubular steel as a guide to make it straight. I've got an eight foot long workbench, and so I was able to use tubes, uh, steel as a guide on that. And I can weld that one horizontally, because it was, that piece was over 10 feet tall. And that's, that's pretty big. I couldn't do that in my shop. I wasn't high, it wasn't high enough. So the one thing about three-dimensional work is, so Tony's work has an obvious sort of a trick of the mind. You're looking at something that looks like it's suspended, but it's actually built to fight gravity. But all three-dimensional artists are always fighting gravity. Anything that you make has to be able to stand up. So someplace in the design work is always the knowledge that you might come up with this idea of how am I going to make something balanced. But it has to be able to do that as well. So even though your work may not be directly about fighting gravity, but there is gravity involved. Always. That's why I start from the bottom up, generally. I tried to roll at the top first, and it just falls down. So, that's a joke. <laughs> I got it. It, it, it really is kind of surprising, because one of the things that 
we always have to build into our pieces is the ability for it to stand up and the ability for it to be produced. And again, if you're a painter and you know you're starting off with a canvas, a flat canvas, which not necessarily all painters do, but as a three-dimensional artist, you know, even if you come up with this vision of something you like, you can go a pretty far way into it and then find out it's just not going to work. And then you can't just put another coat of paint on it or erase it. So have you... I, I'm experiencing that right now. I, I'm, I'm using some old machine chain to make a sphere. And I laid up half of it to, uh, to make, and I realized that the only way I can do well this is on the outside, and it won't look right. And so I poured a concrete mold to have the uh, concave mold um, that I can use to weld it on the inside. So that's something you, you, you have to design for, for fabrication, and you have to keep that in mind. And you don't want to see welds. I mean, on some things it doesn't matter, but on, on this piece that I'm making now, it wouldn't look right at all. So I'm, I, I just poured a couple hundred pounds of concrete to make a concave mold, and we'll see if that works. I'll take one minute, and then, so I had designed this piece, and I had this, what I thought was a great idea, it was made out of shoes, and it was eight feet tall, and the first day I made it, it, was, it took me, a, I shouldn't say the first day, but after I had completed it, which took me a couple of months, I was really happy with it, and I went into the studio the next day, and it had collapsed. So. <laughs> Yes, I've had a lot of those uh, failures too. What you did know? you? But after you had gotten to a certain level and you were feeling good about it? Yeah, absolutely. Like I thought, oh, this is definitely going to hold the weight. And then, you know, drive a few hundred miles in a van and you show up. Yeah, and then tell me I'm bent. And oh, okay. This is, I didn't think that through thoroughly, but those are, you know, over time you figure it out. You know, okay, I need to have a little more support there. And I spent a lot of time hiding my welds too. So. A lot of welding, grinding, smoothing it off so nobody knows it's there, and then you have more of an illusion of movement. Yeah, I think a lot of us who work three-dimensionally start off with these ideas, and we really don't necessarily know how technically we're going to get from the starting point of our ideas to a final product. And if you don't know all the technical steps, which most of us usually don't, it's hard to know if we're going to be successful or not. So, Tony. Does your engineering background help you with that? Um, from a structural point of view, yes. From an artistic point of view, no. <laughs> so I happen to have my own built-in consultant who, when I need uh, creative help, I go to her and say, what do you recommend? And she'll move pieces around. I go, oh, OK, that works. <laughs> but like I said, I was a 90-degree guy for the longest time. And uh, I've had to break out of that paradigm. So, uh, But yeah, it helps to, to, to have a structured background. Yeah, that's a really good question because you have to be able to know that structurally it's going to hold up, but you don't want the structure to take over the aesthetics of the work, which can easily happen as well. And I would imagine for you, Adam, sometimes because you're working so, in the pieces I'm seeing, with so much st structure as a part of it, but I also know that you have a narrative theme that's going to be more important to you. Yeah, it's a blend of the two for sure. I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a terrible like, at math. Like, I just never could excel at it. And yet, I wanted to. So, a lot of my clients are engineers. Like, they love my work because it looks like it's highly engineered, and you know, but it's really, uh, it's not my strong point. But it comes across like that. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see how that goes. Comes yeah, to play. It's part of. We're trying to be intuitive, but we have to be realistic in there. So, and again, you know, painters, you you can float objects any size you want because it's always on a, in a, on a flat plane that doesn't have to stand up in space. So, you know, sometimes we fantasize about these pieces. I had done a series of pieces with these neodymium uh, magnets. Are you familiar with that? Yes. They're really, really powerful magnets, so I was trying to float things. And it's just kind of interesting to sort of extend the limits of what you can do in a physical space with a, some aesthetic idea ahead of time. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Do I owe you something? Maybe later. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I think we've used up our time. Is there somebody, a uh, next group waiting for us to depart?